So I, in the third week, I went and got the book because I am told by my bookstore manager, McAllister, you need to show a book. <laughs> so we're using this thing called You. And it's a book by Ernest Holmes. It's one of my favorites, along with uh, my ever, other favorite by him is Can You Talk to God? Um, and this is just a pearl, absolute pearl. And um, Maureen is um, also doing a class on Thursday nights that basically they take my discussion here, my talk here, and then on Thursday night they take that um, deeper and they do all the experientials. It's full of experientials, is it not? Yes. All you people that are taking the classes, so it really is sweet. So Ernest Holmes says, open the gates of your consciousness to the divine presence and you will be flooded with light. Consciously commune with the spirit and you will receive a direct answer. The answer will always fit your individuality because you are light individualized. That's why I love him. Just has such, you know, such pearls of wisdom all the time. So we're going to talk today about intuitive living and what does that mean. And so we believe in this philosophy that the core of our be being is that divine life. It is that connection to spirit because you are spirit in form. And so that is the core of who and what we are. Now, interestingly enough, in this human form, we have volition, or um, also known as choice. And that divine light, that core principle that is you, can only work through you at the level you allow it. So there could be some people that you think, well, they're not acting very nice or whatever. That's OK. That's their choice. It does not mean that God does not exist in and through and as them because he's in and through and as everything. So on the outside of that core, we have our personality. And our personality is made up of true beliefs, false beliefs, our ego, spirit. It is that, um, I like to call it those building blocks that we put out in front of us that says, oh no, you don't get to see me, you get to see this covers up our vulnerability, makes us sometimes um, suspect or not trust people. It is that wall that we build, and we start putting in those bricks at a very, very young age. The first time somebody says, don't run, it's not ladylike. <laughs> the first time, I don't know what they say to boys, I'm sorry, you know, I was pretty much um, an only child because my brother, huh? don't, oh, don't cry, of course, don't cry. Only girls cry. All of those things started building that foundation of how we were supposed to behave in the world. And if we didn't behave the way we were supposed to, I don't know about you, I went to a school where I got put in the closet because I didn't know how to be quiet. I thought we were here to have fun. Say Maureen's agreement. I did. I thought we were supposed to talk and have fun. I thought that's why we were here on earth. And my teacher would either make me sit up in front of the class on a big stool. Um, he, he was my favorite teacher. I don't know why, because he'd make, make me wear dunce glasses. I think I probably liked the attention. Yeah. <laughs> didn't, didn't quit me from talking, I'll tell you that much. Then he'd put me in the hall. You know, from first grade, I remember, Gail, you need to go stand up in the closet. Yeah, I know. And they were scary closets, could I just say that? Um, so anyway, whatever that was, that builds a foundation. Because those little minds listen to these, what we consider big minds, these adults, and we build, okay, that's how I'm supposed to behave. I'm not supposed to run, that's not ladylike. You know, I'm not supposed to have fun and giggle out loud because I don't want to draw attention to myself. You know, I don't know what you guys did to get through that, I drink. I don't recommend that, but to let my personality out, that's what I did, to give myself the freedom. Unfortunately for me, I'm also, I also have a little bit of a disease, and so it didn't work well in my life. Did not work well in my life. However, what I realized was when I got clean and sober was finding that person gently. You know, I didn't want to be the person who drank. However, I wanted to find the freedom to be who I was supposed to be. That's what we're here to do. That's the gift we're supposed to give each other. Who are we supposed to be? And I think we're supposed to be here and we're supposed to be loud. And we're
we're supposed to be funny. And if you're men, you're supposed to cry. And if you're girls, you're supposed to run and yell and scream and twirl around and lift up your skirt. <laughs> really? I mean, who cares? Okay, maybe for teenagers, not so much. Just <laughs> saying. <laughs> and telling them how to behave. We all know how to behave. <coughs> we do. I think even when we were little tiny souls, that divine thing within us knew how we were supposed to behave. We weren't going to, we weren't out here to hurt anybody. And I think we are here to have fun. And it's why we sing and we dance on Sunday. And I know that some people come in and they're like, what are you people doing? <laughs> Don't you know how you're supposed to behave on Sunday? No. no. Thank you, God. My dad golfed on Sunday, and my mom didn't drive. So if I wanted to go to church, I had to hitch ride with people across the street. And I did it when I was very young, and then I got, you know, other things became more interesting than going to church on Sunday. So I didn't know there was a way we were supposed to behave. I thought we were supposed to behave like I got to behave when I was in Sunday school. You got to play, you got to have fun. So, you guys get to play and have fun with me. Because what happens is, your personality stops your intuition. And when you start practicing your intuition, then your emotions and your physical being will start to respond. And you'll hear it, you'll feel it, you'll sense it. I'm supposed to do that. There was, uh, I was in a class with somebody actually at Santa Fe Center for Spiritual Living when I um, was a practitioner over there. And he um, lives in the central part of Santa Fe and he works at the college. And every morning he gets up very early to go to work and he always drives down St. Francis and he always drives in the fast lane. Just a habit. And one day he got this clear message Get out of the fast lane. He's like, get out of the fast lane. And so he moved over two lanes. And within 15 seconds, a car was headed right towards him in the fast lane, going the wrong way. That's your intuition. Now here's the thing. We all have it. It's not special. It is like any other thing that we have. It is like exercise. The more you do it, I'm waiting for this to happen in my life, the more you do it, the more you enjoy it, the more you'll do it, you'll have a healthy body. I'm still trying, I still am not trying to get there. I made a pact with somebody, I'm doing it. I, you know, it's a practice. It's a practice and I keep falling off of it. And intuition is a practice. You know, I remember being, um, my going into both of my, my first and second marriage, and I got a clear body hit. Whoa, don't do this. Didn't listen. Didn't listen. Paid no attention whatsoever. So listen to yourself. Yes, we do get clues from people around us, and if you really ask and listen, then you will get those spiritual hits yourself. So what is intuition? Ernest Holmes says, intuition is God in man, revealing to him the realities of being. And just as instinct guides the animal, so would intuition guide man, if he, if he would allow it to do so. So we all have a passion. Yes? Yes. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And sometimes we think, oh, but I have to do this. Take your passion to whatever it is you think you have to do. You know, because here's the deal. When I worked for the Bell System, I didn't know that that wasn't my passion. And I never went to work thinking, I hate this. I wish I didn't have to do this. It's the only, you know, I have to make money, I have to support my family. I went to work and I liked it. I think I liked it because it got me out of, away from my personal life, which I didn't like so much, interestingly enough. So I had a really good work ethic. 
I'd get up at 5 o'clock, I'd get in my car at 5.30, I'd be in the building at 6, and I would leave at 6 o'clock at night, and then I'd drive home. Very little at home time. Lots of at work time. And I did love it because it was an escape. But it did bring me joy. You know, that escape gave me that breath that I needed instead of being in the chaos. And whatever our passion is, we can take it to no matter what we're doing today. We all don't get to be um, Michael Beckwith, if you know who he is, or the Pope, if you know who he is. Everybody knows who he is. Um, you know, you don't, not everybody gets to be the Rolling Stones. It doesn't mean that you quit singing or that you quit having a center to talk to people. It means that you bring your passion, whatever it is, to everything that you do. Because when you do that, the universe is going to say yes. And you'll start to notice how other things that show up in your life to support your passion. I had no idea 12 years ago that I would be doing this someday. Not a clue. I didn't even have a clue of who I was 12 years ago. And amazingly enough, spirit just kind of, or you know, my higher self just kind of kept saying, maybe you want to do this. Maybe you want to do this. You know, I share with people because when you go into practitioner training, um, you know, at the end of it, you not only take a written test, you have to panel in front of other ministers, other practitioners and ministers. And then, you get up here like Jean did this morning, and you read, and you, you know, and you're standing up in front of people. I had this much confidence when I started going through practitioner studies. When I did the interview process to see if they'd accept, accept me into being a practitioner, my higher self hid, hid that from me. I had no idea I was being interviewed. I thought they just wanted to talk to me. <laughs> Two ministers sitting there asking me these questions. When I had a clue was that when they said to me, so could you leave the room for a minute? And I'm like, okay. <laughs> if I must, okay. And when I came back in, they said, congratulations, you're going into practitioner studies. I was like, I didn't know there was a question. If I'd known, I wouldn't have done it. <laughs> I know this about myself. I wouldn't have done it. <clears throat> so wasn't that amazing? At the end of the class, when they said, now you have to panel in front of three uh, other people, I'm like, what? What does that mean? You have to walk into a room, and you know they're going to ask you questions. You're going to have to pray in front of them. And I was like, OK. Now that one I knew about, and I did, I did do OK on that. But the first time Reverend Susie, who was the first minister I had, said to me, so what Sunday would you like to have podium? I was like, well, what's podium and why would I want it? <laughs> you know? So it was interesting that I got, I saw the practitioner standing up there. I just didn't think when I became one, I'd be one. I guess I don't know what my thought process was. But there was something shielding me along the way so I wouldn't back up. That was my intuition. That was my core. Walking with me and saying, oh, don't let her look over there, because that was scary. <laughs> so there's that fire within you. You know, I came into ministerial school, I really thought I knew what I was going to do. I was going to get my degree, and I was going to write books, and it would look really great at the bottom to say, it looked like Reverend Gail Dillon. Who cares if none of you knew who I was? It would look great. And then I went to Albuquerque and stood up on a stage like this and spoke to all of these people and then had to tell my husband, who thought we were going to write books and travel, I want to do the church. And he was like, what? <laughs> when did that happen? It's just one of those things that when, when you're ready, it happens, regardless of what it is. So whatever your fire is, first of all, be careful who you share it with. We all have family and friends, and they love us, and they can be a little fear-based at times. So when you say to them, oh, I'm going to move to Santa Fe. Oh, you don't want to do that. There's no jobs in Santa Fe. The cost of living is too high. You don't know anybody. Why would you move to Santa Fe? Well, because I want to. Had no idea why I knew I needed to be here. And I 
didn't listen to them. However, sometimes we get stopped in our tracks, do we not? Because we think we're going to tell our very best friend, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open a church in Santa Fe. And they'll be like, are you out of your mind? There's already one of those in Santa Fe. Santa Fe doesn't need two of those. Why would you do that? I don't know, because that's what I'm supposed to do. Have you ever felt that way? You just know. That is what I'm supposed to do. I remember, I'm going to tell a tale on you, honey, I'm sorry. <laughs> I remember when uh, Paul and I were going through real financial difficulty. And I would say to him, all I want to do is find a place that we can live in, that we can live off of my retirement check, because I knew it was constant, and we could afford it, and we could eat and pay the rent. That's all I wanted. I knew what the rent had to be, and it, we were paying way more than that. Well, at the time, we were going through bankruptcy. They foreclosed on our house. They repossessed our car, and he was being very practical. That's never going to happen. They're going to check, you know, they're going to check your references, and your references are going to be bad. They're going to ask for a deposit, and we don't have the money. And I would say, very nicely, oh, you won't. <laughs> I didn't want to hear that. And as you all know, I live in this magnificent home that Elizabeth and John Rogers owned that was just perfect rent, double in size from what we were, what we were renting, and they are the perfect landlords. You know, I keep saying to everybody, why would I buy? Renting is so wonderful. And they say, and you have perfect landlords. You know, not everybody is so fortunate, so I have to remember that. But the intuition told me when I was at um, an event with, with Elizabeth to turn to her and say, you know what I'm looking for? And when I told her, she went, did you know that I have a house for rent and it just became available this month? Now, what's very cute is Elizabeth would call me and say, because, well, you guys will meet her. She's in Hawaii right now. But anyway, she loves, she has gorgeous homes. And so she walked into this house, and evidently the previous renter had not treated it very nicely. And she'd call me, and she'd say, oh, Gail, I don't know if you want this house. And I would literally say to her, is there a fence backyard? Are there bathrooms? Is there a studio for my husband? Yes, yes, and yet I want this house. That's all I wanted. A backyard for my dogs and fence, studio for my husband, and bathroom so I could shower. The rest I didn't care about. I knew the house was perfect because there was something inside me that kept saying, yes, yes. So that's your intuition. That is what pulls you. And don't, when people get in the way, I promise you, if you step off your course, the universe or your higher self will find a way to pull you back. To pull you back. It's snowing, just so you know. Mm -hmm. I just heard it, sorry. Okay, I haven't had one of those in a while, so. All right. So remember not to be pushed by your problems, be pulled by your dreams. We have a sign in the living room that says, Don't tell God you have a big problem. Tell your problem you got a big God. Because if we are all God-informed, we're all here to love and support each other. That's why we're here, and it should be fun. So interestingly enough, um, today, because I have, I have daily readings that I do every day that come in my email, and this one's by Albert Einstein, and I thought, well, how perfect. A human being is part of the whole called by us universe. A part limited in time and space. They experience themselves, their thoughts and feelings as something, something separated from the rest. A kind of optical delusion of their consciousness. This delusion is a kind of prison for us, restricting us to our personal desires and to affection for a few persons nearest to us. Our task must be to free ourselves from this prison by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty. Namaste. Namaste.